Hello everybody, this is Justin Rohner coming at you for agroscaping.com and this podcast today is going global. So agroscaping is going global and I have with me on the phone right now with me, actually calling in from Portugal, I've got Lawrence and Kimberly Manchi and they've actually created the Kila Yoga Farm out there in Portugal. So welcome, welcome Lawrence, welcome Kimberly. Hi Justin, thank, thank you. you. Well, now I'm in the minority of cool accents today, so I, <laughs> yeah, I love it. You know, you, you're connected with Chris, one of our guys, Chris, our operations director. He's got a wonderful British accent, and so I, I definitely love it around. It, it's really fun, too, here in Arizona where that accent isn't so readily found or an accent like that is not so readily found. How drawn seemingly all the women gardeners are to that that voice tonalities and, and, the, and that <laughs> it's, it, it blows my mind. So it's uh it's great, and Chris probably doesn't even know that he's got a uh he's got a leg up on all the women gardeners here in the Phoenix area. <laughs> <laughs> leg up. <laughs> so not a leg over. Yeah, yeah, he's got a leg up. But anyway, it's just it's a really cool. It's love the accent, love love the internationality of the concepts as they're developing and how the it's really a global movement of of food people reconnecting to their food source. Is that something you found as well? Uh, yeah. Now tell me a little I mean, bit more about this uh, Kila Yoga Farm. I mean, I love farming. I am terrible at yoga, and I don't even know what a Kila is. So I know what a Kila <laughs> is, but I do not know what a Kila is. Well, the a Kila is just a name. Uh, it doesn't mean anything. It isn't anything. It's just the, the name that unifies, um, makes us unique. You know, so mm -hmm. people can find us and. Um, the idea is that we are people that want to live sustainably. Um, so we want to try and grow our own food, create our own energy, and share with other people how to do that. Um, so we live all more or less on a farm um, where we have animals and we have trees and vegetables. And we just believe that uh, yoga is good for you as well. So we practice yoga and teach yoga. So we do a bit of both here. And um, yeah, Kid Yoga Farm is just the name that we came up with so that we could do our Facebook page and website and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like Kila is going to have the meaning that you place to it. It's a creation in, of your own, just like the bringing yoga and farming together. I haven't, haven't heard of that uh, except for myself last night doing yoga with my wife, which isn't really, I don't know if you'd call it a yoga session. If you watch me sitting there, it looks like I'm just trying to sit up straight, which I'm that <laughs> Well, that's part of what it's about. Yeah, that's what yoga's about. <laughs> right, and I'd certainly need some more flexibility. And um, yeah, so bringing this all together, where did this start for you? This vision for the Kila Yoga Farm. Uh, well, we both have different ideas of where it started. Actually, it was quite funny. <laughs> but for me, uh, it was when we went to a yoga retreat in Bali, in Indonesia, and um, after a week of just doing yoga and meditation and then going home and trying to keep up that same lifestyle it was really tricky you know you sort of come out of the bubble and you go straight back to work and I thought there's got to be more more to life than just working I want to live in a yoga retreat that would be amazing so that's kind of why we sort of geared ourselves towards doing this so quickly was so that we could have this like peaceful lifestyle with meditation and yoga every day. Well, this is really intriguing for me. So tell me more about kind of the business model that you guys have for the Kila Yoga Farm. What, what's, what are the major revenue sources to, to make it sustainable? Obviously, living sustainably on a resource perspective is one thing, but living sustainably and having a financial backing to make something work like this. I'd, I'd love to know a little bit more about what your model is. Is that something you're willing to share? So yeah, we, we, we basically want to live rather than always have to make money to live. We just want to live. So we're coming here in Portugal, the, we have 18 hectares of land, two lakes, um, houses, arable land, trees, everything for like 70,000 US dollars. So we could buy it without having any mortgage or anything like that. Um, we grow our own food, so there's not really, um, any much food costs and we have our own energy so apart from the setup cost 
there isn't really very much that we have to pay for. The main thing is petrol. So as you're right, we need to sustain ourselves financially, but the amount that we need to make is really small. So our, our model is to try and have a happy life share what we do with other people in the form of volunteering so people come here and volunteer learn how we do things have a go at gardening learn about how we make a food forest and how we work the, the soil and uh, contribute just a small amount and that small amount over a lot of people covers the cost of being here and then every now and then we're going to run courses we're running a course in november on on food forests um, and we're doing yoga retreats to try and get a little bit of extra money for investment. But the, the key model is not spending money <laughs> and having a life where where we can sustain ourselves without having to uh, without needing to go on holiday. Very cool. Yeah. yeah our, our website has gone down two days ago. Yeah. I just tried so, to pull it up. I'm like, oh, no, yeah. it's been suspended. Suspended. Yeah. Our, our host uh, host hosting. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they've gone. The whole company's gone. So I've just spent today on the computer uh, to try and get a new host and um, upload our backup file. So it's not been a fun day. <laughs> that can happen. I mean, it's the the peculiarities of of the new digital age. You know, as Chris and I always joke about it, where it's a uh, you know, technology is great when it works. When it doesn't work. Yeah. 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 And we've, we've really come here to get away from all of that, but we rely <laughs> on it so much at the same time to, to advertise and get people here. So it's really important. So where do you find here, most people come coming here. from for you? Where, where do you find most people coming from for you? All of the people that come to us come through our website. They find us on the internet and they come here. And uh, with our website down, that's a real problem. <laughs> Um, we are actually full for the rest of the year, uh, with except for one of our courses, so it's not, it's not a big problem. But um, it's because we, when we say we do farming, we do gardening, we do gardening following the permaculture principles, and we do yoga. And I don't think there's many people doing both of those together. So when you put permaculture and yoga in Google, we come up quite high, and that means uh, – people are coming here because they find us online all right and then when it's down obviously it makes it a little more difficult yeah. well there's less emails to deal with <laughs> <laughs> that could be a gift that could be a great gift <laughs> <laughs> well this is this is awesome I, i'd really love to be able to see some pictures i'm curious if i can uh maybe there's another way i can find some pictures maybe you've got facebook you can go to our facebook page there we go so when in doubt the facebook page should be up and so people can actually just go to Facebook and actually look you up on Keela, K-E-E-L-A, Yoga yeah, Farm. Yoga Farm, yeah. I guess some of the people find us through Facebook, some find us through the website because we're more active on the Facebook group. It's easier to update. Yeah, it is. I've actually found a number of more new age companies are starting to just use Facebook as their website as opposed to using a, and going and paying for a, a specific website. Yeah, it's great. I mean, and the, the more people that have been here, uh, and the more people that really follow us, so they share all our posts, and then their friends want to come. So mm -hmm. really, Facebook is a really amazing way to to um, get people to come to come here because they just everyone just shares the, the posts. Yeah, I'm looking through some of the posts right now. It looks like it's kind of a day in the life of Keela Farm kind of going on. You got nice little videos all about stuff you guys are just doing there on site. Yeah. Harvesting yeah, potatoes. Yeah, I, I quite <laughs> – I, I carry my camera with me everywhere. Oh, that's awesome. So tell me more about the – what is a day in the life like on Kela Farm? Uh, well, when we haven't got any volunteers here, when it's just me and Lawrence, which is like this week, um, we have to let our 80 sheep out of their pen. 80 sheep, um, eight zero, right? Yeah. Wow. We're actually, uh, it's our neighbor, it's his sheep, and we're sort of letting them feed in our fields at the moment because we've got quite a lot of land that they can use. Um, so we let them out, 
uh, we let our ducks out, feed them, let our chickens out. Um, oh, and the goats. Yeah, we've got a couple of goats. Um, feed the cats, feed the dogs, water the plants, the growing gardens. Um, and then that takes us to about breakfast time. <laughs> wow. See, that list of things to do might be someone's week of working in a, in a garden, you know. Yeah, well, yeah. we'll split that between us. So one of us will be doing, uh, I do the gardening, Kimber does the animals um, before breakfast. And I've tried to, because as our gardens have got quite big, we're trying to automate things with irrigation and things like that, rather than hand watering. So it speeds things up where I can mm. do all of it in an hour. Um, which is quite fast considering there's quite a lot. That is quite a lot. Now, do you guys milk the sheep as well? I mean, tell me all the what. <laughs> uh, no, they um, the ones that are being milked have stayed at our friend's house, and so he deals with all of that. We weren't quite ready, and we didn't have the resources to do that quite yet. <laughs> but we just made some flan and yesterday some chocolate mousse with with the goat's milk, which is uh, with the sheep's, sheep's milk. milk. Yeah, which was quite fun. But yeah, he does it. Yeah, I've been really intrigued by it. I'm, I'm kind of wanting to get rid of my lawnmower and thought if I bought a couple of sheep, that might help. Definitely. Oh, my God, they eat everything. But they, they multiply <laughs> quite fast, so you'll end up with 15 sheep. <laughs> oh, my. Well, it's kind of like we've, we've got rabbits. I try to use those as my lawnmowers, but they, they kind of go after everything else, and they dig holes and some other issues. But, you know, rabbits have been fun as well. So how does the volunteer system work for you guys? Most people that come here – want to do what we did you know they, they live in a city they have a busy stressful job and they dream of um, coming out to the country and living the good life and like us they've come to see what other people are doing first um, which is what we did and and I say half the people that come here are doing that and they come here and they just help out with the daily tasks and with whatever projects we have going on and that could be 50 percent of the work is the gardening and the other half is building um we're always working on developing the land because it was developing the buildings because it was derelict for so long and as we get more animals and more volunteers we need more places and we're using uh, natural building techniques as much as possible so building with like mud and things like that and um and when they're not doing that, then they're helping with daily chores like cooking, dealing with the animals, emptying the compost bin, fun <laughs> jobs like that. <laughs> so how many volunteers do you have at any one time? Well, on uh, next Wednesday, we've got seven people arriving and they're here for around about a month. Um, but the most we've had at one time was 17 people all together. And so are these people just in tents? Are they sleeping with the sheep? Where do they where do they hang out? <laughs> uh, no, we've got people in tents. Some people come in their own vans or um, like converted uh, cars and trucks and whatever. Uh, but we've got caravans for rent as well. Um, and soon we'll have more spaces for rent like teepees, but we haven't put them up yet. Now, have you ever had families show up like, you know, the parents and the kids that bring the whole family? Yeah, we've had um, – my parents came with my brother and his kids. Oh, that's cool. Um, and they loved it. The kids just thought it was the best thing ever. They live in a city in England, and this was like heaven because they can just go and play in the in the forest and use sticks for swords and all sorts. It's great. We've had yeah. quite a few families that come through. Yeah. With young kids. Yeah, we've had – yeah. The, the children, the, the young children love it. They can play with animals all day. Um, they follow me around doing a little bit of gardening or whatever I'm doing, and they absolutely love it, uh, the young children. Although we don't advertise as a place for children, but <laughs> they end up coming and they just... They, they like just, it more than their parents. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think they would, and that's the beauty of the curiosity of those of kids, you know, and how malleable they are, right? They don't... Yeah, yeah, definitely. In the yeah. sense, they haven't it's been so indoctrinated different. into all the, the, the creature comforts, as it were. They're just like, hey, whatever. I'm just curious about everything. You know, whatever you got. Yeah. Yeah. Good. 
Well, that's awesome. I mean, I definitely, you know, maybe you can put on there, it's like all family friendly. You don't have to necessarily advertise you want a bunch of kids to come, but it's family yeah. friendly. I know we just we do worry that we are still a bit of a building site so we've got nails sticking up and sharp bits of wood and you know there's holes here and there yeah we still we still worry a about little. their safety <laughs> well it sounds like an eight-year-old and up kind of scenario that would probably be their the best thing you know kids are old the enough and they're about eight they've got enough of a conscience that they they'll, they'll pay attention right but all the younger yeah. kids that I've been here they run around as they do and they never, they've never hurt themselves here, but as soon as they yeah. go to the, the village, they trip up on a flat pavement or sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> hurt They're taking the flat pavement for granted, I guess, huh? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so what's been your experience living out there? I mean, are you guys totally off the grid? Yeah. We okay. have, we have um, solar panels for energy, and we've now just... Um, since we last spoke with Chris, have installed much larger solar panels. So we're pretty much living normal, almost normal life electricity wise. We just try and use the, the appliances during the day. But before we were living with hardly any energy at all. And then we've got our own water supply. And then we have a, a mobile phone which connects us to the world, which has Internet on it, which is what we're using now. To, and um, yeah. So we're completely off off the grid. Uh, we obviously need to buy petrol for a car and things like that. But um, otherwise, well, I'm feeling more sustainable just talking to you guys. That, I mean, you guys are getting this all from the sun right now. This is wonderful. <laughs> I'm I'm wired into everybody else's stuff, you know. But uh, <laughs> yeah, that that is awesome. And so with the uh, what what was the weirdest, I guess, I'm curious what some of the weirdest scenarios you've had living off the grid. I mean, what was surprising to you as you jumped off the grid? I think, uh, I think, uh, I think um, it was I, a lot harder than we thought. <laughs> I think, I think realizing how much energy we use, that you don't really think about it when you're at home, you've got, you know, electricity all day, all night, and you can plug in a phone, a computer, you can have your your computer charging and your dishwasher on and your washing machine all at the same time and you never even think about it and then you come to live off grid and you can't do that so we were having when we were on our old system when we only had four solar panels we would put on the washing machine and then because of that the wood chipper would cut out and the all the tools would stop working that were plugged in um if we left a laptop in overnight um it would drain the batteries completely uh stuff like that you just oh, wow. don't think about it it's stuff that you've never thought about and now we're so on top of it we like we're turning lights off we turn off stuff at the fuse box people are told they can't they can't charge stuff after a certain time and it's hard for people when they arrive you know sorry you can't charge your laptop after 6 p.m but that's just it. It's just the rules. <laughs> like, otherwise, we run out of energy. I think the one thing that I really noticed on that energy note is that we have this fancy system where it can monitor what energy we're creating and using. And what we tried to do is just try to see how low we could get without using anything. And uh, we wanted to know how much energy it takes to boil a kettle because we were using mm -hmm. gas and fire to warm water. And we thought, well, we've got all this energy, let's use a kettle. So we used the kettle and we saw, and then we realized it uses the same amount of energy as a kettle to open a fridge. Whoa. You open the fridge, some of the cold comes out and you close it. And then it's like, it's like. It zaps, it's unreal. Yeah. So the same amount of energy to get a, a kettle on the boil basically is, is used when you just open the fridge and it has to then recool back down. That's right. Wow. And especially because it's so hot here in the summer as well. So you can't just open the fridge and have a look in and be like, oh, what do I feel like having? I'm just going to browse the shelves. I've got the munchies. You can't do that. You've got to be like, right, what am I getting? I need to, I need to be specific. Get it? Get out. <laughs> it's like a, it's not a snack bar. It's, it's more like a, you can always put a lock on it. Like this, this fridge will only be open twice a day or three times a day. And here's the, 
you almost, that's, that's yeah, exactly. You know, it's, it's reminding people as well of that. I mean, when someone's helping in the kitchen, you've got to be really quite strict and say, please don't leave the fridge door open. It uses so much energy. And people don't realize until we show them the stats that we've got on the energy consumption for the day. And it's not till they see that and they go, oh, OK, I get it now. <laughs> wow. But then there's the water, you know, like um, the water, there's always problems with it because we are getting water ourselves from a well and we're reliant on uh, pumps and our own plumbing and I could have had a really hard day's work and I've just been back to back from 5 a.m. and it's like my first time to sit down and open a beer and then someone says, Lawrence, there's no water. <laughs> so I put the beer down and, and then before I would have to get two people to help me. So everyone's having their time off relaxing. And I'm like, who wants to come and pump water? <laughs> Which is a half an hour job. Well, I heard once that uh, things are only stressful if you have to do them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's really, yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you choose to, do it, I mean, you just kind of relax into it. Or maybe it's maybe it's like yoga. Maybe I'm learning something from yoga. You know, you got to breathe the breathe the air into the part where there's energy. You know, you got to breathe the air into it so it releases the tension. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I, I try to force myself to make to do a, a split position or you know a whatever I've got to do. You know, it's it's breathing air into it, letting it relax into that new. Thing I thought I had to do, but now I can choose it, and now it's different. Different energy entirely. Exactly. Yeah. We would love to choose to not to do the water. <laughs> <laughs> but every time we find, we find something that does cause stress, we look at, well, how can we get rid of this? So with the water thing, we 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 got a guy. We did an exchange with a local guy um, for some work. We gave him some hay from our land, and he came and helped us install a relay to automate the pumping. So every time we do have something that might be frustrating, we just find a way to stop that from happening again. Well, that sounds like me and taxes in my business. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I hated doing it. And then I find an accountant who loved doing it. I'm like, well, here, 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 here you go. Take it away. Yeah. You know, fix my <laughs> message. <laughs> yes. If you enjoy this so much, it is all yours. <laughs> So do you prepare the people that are coming? I mean, in advance, uh, do you like send them a little guide and say, OK, to get used to doing power here where we're at, be, to live sustainably and off the grid, try to live a week with only one plug in your entire house. So no other things can be plugged in, just that one plug. I mean, do you do stuff like <laughs> that? I mean, I'm just thinking, how would I prepare myself one for plug, something like this? One plug during sunlight is what we'd have to say. Oh, yeah. there you go. Only yeah, during yeah. daylight hours. Yeah, an optimum daylight hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good idea. Yeah, it's a good idea. It is a nice idea. And only on no, sunny don't. days. No cloudy days. You can't. Uh... Yeah. And not when your next door neighbor's had his on all night. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it's it's like you you almost want to want to prepare people so they kind of know what they're coming to, but not scare them away at the same time, right? I think that anyone who comes somewhere like this. They're prepared. They already read, read the website and they want to live off grid. Mm -hmm. They want to come and see what it's like. And actually for the volunteers and for the guests, it's actually a really pleasant experience. They, any, any problems that come up, we do, we deal with it. Um, all the people that are staying here long, longer term. Um, people leave here feeling good because they're away from Wi-Fi. They're away from the busy roads. Um, they're away from their Facebook and things like that. So I think they actually enjoy being away from all this stuff. It's more it's more uh, for us running the farm because we are looking after people and we're doing yoga and gardening. And gardening is, uh, as, as you guys know, requires your attention all the time. So we just have quite a lot, quite a lot to do, don't we? Mm. So when when there's unexpected things going wrong, that's when problems happen. And, and here there are unexpected things every day. Mm -hmm. It's interesting in the in the city, you typically find people that really are living lives without much purpose. But where you guys are at, it sounds like everything is about the purpose. You know, there's a purpose surrounding everything you do. Yeah. Yeah, there is. And it's actually a really nice, um, it's a nice 
change. We we did have purpose in the city, you know, we had to get on a train and had to go to work. <laughs> but here it's sort of, well, we're getting up for ourselves and we don't want our animals to be so hot in their houses. We need to let them out. And normally at the end of the day, we get something out of them like eggs or, um, you know, we might get sheep's milk from our friend who's given us the sheep and we get loads of veggies. So yeah, there's always like, there's an end result, which is fantastic. I mean, I've always said to them, if they don't, if they don't give us eggs, we'll eat them. Ah, there you go. <laughs> it's direct accountability. There's some just some real honest accountability there. Right? <laughs> yeah. Give me, give me eggs or I will eat you, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know back in the day when I started learning gardening at my, with my mom, you know, she had this big plum tree and that plum tree never produced plums for years. And it was this big plum tree. And she went out one year and she said, okay, plum tree, if you don't give me plums, you're gone. The next year it had so many plums. And Ooh. I don't know if it just listened to mom that day or if she pruned it different. But for me, I was like, oh, plants listen to mom. I'll, you know, <laughs> this is this is important. But it was neat to see that and to see and you know experience just the accountability associated with work and then a return. And on a farm, yeah. obviously you can get that back a lot faster than people realize. Like you were saying with chicken eggs, it's like they're giving you eggs every day. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, we've um, we notice it a lot more now as well. I mean, we used to have a garden on our on our rooftop in Singapore. And yeah, we'd get um, basil and like all the good herbs and turmeric and ginger. But now we're getting like eggplants and courgettes and amazing stuff. We have we've got onions, like it's fantastic. But it is a lot of work. We've got so many potatoes, but it took a lot of work to get them. It actually makes you appreciate eating them a hell of a lot more. Yeah, I think the, the, return, the return for the work, less, less than actual the problem produce is the, the pleasure of eating your own produce mm -hmm. because it seems that with almost everything that the amount of work that goes into to do it organically um is you know, if you take your t time into consideration is a lot more expensive than, than buying it mm. and uh it's the, just the feeling that this meal is our, our own food and sometimes we've actually gone a month with 10 people here and not not buying any any fresh food at all um and just a great feeling that we get from that yeah yeah i was curious on how well you guys were able to produce and uh, is it consistent throughout the year i guess and able to produce enough for 10 people well we don't really know because we've only really done it for six months and we've only been <laughs> producing for like the last like how many yeah three or whatever um I mean, at the moment, like we supplement with um, garlic and onions from the vegetable guy in the village. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, we eat mainly from the land. Yeah. Unless we've got something specific that you really want, but we we seem to make it work. We we, we buy uh, like uh, dried foods as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like quinoa or Lentils. spices, stuff like that. But uh, with regards to fresh food, yeah, yeah, and we we are going to going to be able to sustain that, no problem. But it's Kimberly does a lot of the cooking, and there are months where you're only going to have two vegetables, so we could sustain it. But Kimberly doesn't want to cook the same vegetables for the people every day, so there will be times where we will we will buy we will pickle pickle that and buy something else for just for variation. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm pretty good at cooking cabbage in many, <laughs> many, 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 many different ways. <laughs> but sometimes you need something else. <laughs> I totally understand that. It's important to have that little bit of diversity just for the – so it feels like you're living rather than dredging, right? It, exactly, exactly. So Because the guests come and go, but, you know, we're always here. We, still, we want to have that variety. Oh, they don't come and say, well, I just want some cabbage. Can I just have some cabbage and water? <laughs> Give me some nice cabbage soup again. Please. Yes, cabbage soup. Can we have that every day? Yeah. <laughs> it's very good for you. <laughs> oh, no doubts. No doubts on that. But uh, it, 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 may do, it may do poorly for my mental state over an experience. <laughs> yes. My creativity might wane with, you know, just that. 
exactly so tell me more Next about the months. yoga the yoga integration you know what uh, why yoga um, well we both started practicing yoga about well separately before we met 10 years ago and um, it, we went to do our teacher training before we even decided to come to Portugal so we were quite fully um, immersed within yoga beforehand um, and it just seems to work so well with living in nature you know you can ha it's all about being quiet and quietening the mind and it works so well here because there's so much opportunity to do it and also it's really good for strengthening the body so we need people to be strong to build stuff so <laughs> come to yoga <laughs> That is it. Yeah, that's that's important stuff. My, I I did a a Facebook live with my kids when we were up in the up in the northern states. You guys might want to check it out and see how terrible I am. Maybe you can critique me on my yoga because I did a yeah, little right. kids yoga thing in the morning with my you know just to get my kids going, and so I just filmed it just for fun. Um, but it definitely even my kids, you know, they they notice a difference when they're doing the yoga. They just feel better, just more aligned, and and they feel the extent of their ability. It's like this physical body has as has has its limits, but it also can be stretched. And that just yeah. the breathing process, it's all of a sudden, hey, my legs are sliding further apart. He's like, yeah, isn't that cool? It's like, but they felt so tight a second ago, you know, but just the breathing <laughs> process that starts stretching out and they're like, hey, it's working. Yeah, I think it's great for kids because they spend so long in the in their classroom sitting at their desks. I think it's actually really good for them to have that experience rather than like playing football or or other sports yoga is good for kiddies so how do you schedule the yoga in there in your daily routines with your volunteers is it something like it's done three times a day uh you know what what do you guys do we, we do um mornings every morning it's nice to wake up and just not to talk to anyone and go do a yoga practice and by the time you finish that you're more awake go have breakfast um, and then and then there's a class in the evening which might not be yoga it might be meditation or it might be something different that's fun just something that's either spiritual or physical or rela even just relaxing um, we got lots of different places where we go to like we, 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 we're really remote here we chose this place because no we're really just private there's no neighbors the neighboring land are all um, deserted uh, so we got sunrise spots, sunset spots, quiet bits, green bits. So we move around to these things, um, and yeah, it's always a bit different. But yeah, it's definitely a routine. Every morning, half six yoga, yoga every morning. Evening is more like different every day. Wow. And you guys, for where you're at in Portugal, what's what season is it right now, or is it just kind of the same season all year round? <laughs> no. Oh, no, it's very much summer right now. It's really, really hot. Okay. Really dry, really hot. It's actually fire problem right now around here. Oh, that's one of the things. Yeah, one, yeah. We one. see fire. We see fires every day from in the distance. Well, as long as you see them in the distance, um, that's always nice. Well, we're, you know, it's scary. Yeah. We've yeah. never experienced fires before. We came here. We never thought that we were spending time working on fire breaks and fire evacuation plans and things like that. Well, yeah, that's something that that's uh, that's the season we're in now, dry and hot, yeah. and um, it makes it a challenge to grow food. It's it's um, a challenge. I mean, we can't. And you just got to create shade. You got to find microclimates of the land. You got to uh, water a lot. So water is key. Mm. But uh, yeah, it is it is really hot and dry. <laughs> so when when is the wet season for you guys? What months? Um, the rains come back in October. November. Yeah, October, November through to March. Yeah, but January to March, a bit heavy rain. Yeah. So we'll, we'll start we'll start planting our winter stuff in like November. Um, trees we'll start planting in November, and then we'll be looking forward to summer. <laughs> <laughs> so how cold does it get where you guys are at? Just uh, about two, two to four. Really cold when there's no central heating. And no, <laughs> yeah. And last year when we, well, earlier this year when we started, this house that we're in now didn't have any windows or doors. Oh. And it snowed and we were completely open to the elements. So that was, um, that was pretty cold. 
Well, I've heard of Doctors Without Borders, but Houses Without Doors and Windows. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's oh going to catch God, on as well. <laughs> it's a Portuguese thing, you know, we're like, we ordered some doors and windows, and they said they'd install it next week. Two months later, they said next week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> next week. But in the end, we actually built our own door out of scrap wood. Oh, wow. But it did. It, the door ended up showing up, though. It did, yeah. It did. Uh, it's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> So now someone has something to knock on if they choose. If they choose, yeah. All the, you know, the random sheep that are coming by to sell you something, right? You know, all the tele telemarketers <laughs> calling your phone, you know. Oh. Yeah, we don't get too many of them around here, thank God. The only telemarketers you get in Portugal is actually the phone company that you're with <laughs> trying to sell you a phone contract. Uh -huh. <laughs> <It's very funny. laughs> But what a blessing that you have a phone contract because that's what's is that what's making it possible here is this this is a cellular phone only not a landline. Yeah, so yeah. Phone, yeah, pay to go phone, simple, does the job. Amazing that technology can do what it does. That you guys can be basically out in the middle of nowhere, a very rural area, all off the grid, and yet we're having a conversation. Me in Phoenix, you in Portugal. Yeah, yeah it's great. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. Now, if we could just figure out how to get food to transfer that quick, too, you know, that'd be nice. <laughs> you'd want to eat it once it got there, if it went through my phone line. Yeah, what would you like? We're going, we're going to pick it for you. You we'll have to come it. here. Then it's really quick. <laughs> yeah, we just, we were, we're out planting about 90 flats ourselves at a, at a 90 flats at one, one garden location for five restaurants we've been working on today. Wow. Wow. And it's been a fun project, but obviously it's, you know, we, we got to make it look like Disneyland relative to what you guys are probably able to do and just be able to spread out and grow and just let things grow to their full size where we have a confined space. We have certain structures and organization that we need in order to ensure that, you know, it looks so good that uh, people won't be offended by it. <laughs> So tell me more about how your gardens and things are actually laid out there. I'm really curious. I mean, is it is it really super organized or is you just have so much space that you're just kind of, well, that's where the sheep ended up. And so we just put a fence around where they hung out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we've got um, we, we've got quite a lot of land. So the vegetables need to be near the house so we can manage it. We can go and check on it. We've got more open fields further away. So that's where the sheep are. They're, they're not out anywhere near where we where our garden is. And um, yeah, we got we got, got one garden one side of the house which has slightly different climate, um, and and we grow a variety of stuff there, and mainly vegetables. And then we have another area which is um, we call the food forest, so we're growing perennial perennial plants with some annuals in between. And then we have what we call terrace one, which is where we're growing our vegetables. Um, so there's basically three different areas where we grow food. What we're realizing is that, you know, you're talking about a small spot to, it's, it's good to try and reduce the amount of space. I think that we're, we're, we're growing food and really ramp pack it in a smaller space with companion planting. When one plant doesn't do so well, you don't even notice because there's so many there and you just fill in the space. There's less to walk, less space to walk around to check on it. There's places to put in irrigation. So I think, uh, although we have a lot of land, we're really trying to reduce the amount of size uh, of the land that we're growing food on. Wow. So it sounds like from the words you've used, food forest, some of the zones, the uh, you guys studied some permaculture, I take it? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Very good. So rainwater yeah. harvesting, you guys doing some of that as well out there? Yeah, I mean, we are, but the, the thing is here, it, it doesn't rain all summer. <laughs> it rains all winter, so you can't you can't store enough. We've, we actually dug a lake last week uh, with, with the intention to, to, to save rainwater, um, but the only problem we had is when they dug the lake, they hit a spring, and, it, and it's filled up with water from the spring, so there's no space for rainwater. <laughs> So, well, I guess, isn't that a good thing too, though, to have a, a lake filled with spring water? Is that useful? Well, I think it's useful. Yeah, it's definitely useful. 
but we're not saving water. I don't know. We're taking out the ground and letting it evaporate. <laughs> um, you know, our, our aim was to try and hold more water rather than mm-hmm. running off down our, our stream off our land. Um, well, I know yeah, water around here. If we dug, if we dug down and ended up hitting a spring, what we'd end up with is very mineralized water that is considered brackish, almost too salty to even use. So I'm guess at least you got a freshwater spring basically that you found. Is that correct? Yeah, it's fresh water, drinkable water. However, it's in the middle of the sheep field. Oh. So, yeah, at the moment there's a big mound all the way around. They can't get access to it. But uh, we're going to have to move the sheep. We want to keep that nice and clean. <laughs> but I think in the end we're going to probably let animals animals have it um, because it would be too, too difficult to, to separate. The idea, part of the idea of having the, the, the lake was to have it nearer to the house. The animals can be nearer to the house um, for less walking around, checking animals, checking vegetables. Um, but yeah, we were really surprised to see, see water because it's so dry. Our well um, is seven meters deep and it's dried up. And this lake is uphill from the lake, from the well. Hmm. And it found water. It found water. Yeah. I mean, the, a guy did, did go with a stick and say, oh, this is where the water is. And he was a, the guy that does the digging. So we didn't really think that he did know, but he did, didn't he? Mm. <laughs> well, that's cool. It's cool that he can find the water. So it was he was one of those, uh, what do they call them? The ones that find the water with those sticks, kind of a Y-shaped stick? Is that what he well, did? Well, and we, we had paid this guy to come and dig with a bulldozer to dig out all of these invasive flamm- flammable trees mm. um, to prevent, to create a fire break. And we mentioned we wanted a lake, so he snapped off a little twig off a tree and then started walking around with it. And we really just thought he wanted more work for his digger. <laughs> <laughs> because there was a language barrier here, you know. Uh, they yeah. don't speak English. Yeah. So, um, but in the end, where he dug, there was water. But I, we, I think if you were there, you would have thought, that that was the best place to dig as well because you can see it's like a bit of a valley it's a bit more green you don't need a stick you can see that it, it appears to be uh, where the water would collect if it rained yeah that's good sounds like you have a pretty awesome setup and how how much space do you guys have i mean how many acres roughly do you guys got there it's 46 acres well, that's a good amount of space yeah I mean, we have we probably use about four four uh, vegetables and trees we planted and there's probably about uh, 20 which is open land where there's these cork trees growing where the sheep go and there's uh, another like 10 which is where we will start to plant food in the summer which stays more moist in the summer and further downhill so we can uh, alter the gardens by gravity from the lake if you made a mistake of putting our, some, some of our gardens higher up rather than lower down. Well, the things you learn, right? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's in our land, and it's been farmed for a very, very long time, right back to the Romans. And wow. they, they've built all these walls all over the land to manage water. They didn't have technology. They didn't have machines but they could farm there and what i'm starting to realize is that we need to do what they were doing and they were planting in the right place of the land at different times so rather than having like one garden which you which you garden all year long they plant they have one garden for each season Mm. because of how the climate is there and you plant your stuff that you need to irrigate downhill from the lake and you don't need a, a water pump and you plant stuff that you don't need to water uphill from the lake. And here, there's things like olive trees, grapevine, which they can just plant. Um, and you can, you can get wine and olive oil. And you don't have to water it. Well, that's nice. So um, it just takes the natural water that's already flowing through that underground network of things and keeps them watered. And Yeah. I mean, they don't need much water. Wow. And the same with the cork trees. So what advice do you have for our listeners as we close this program up? If they wanted to change their current lifestyle into a similar lifestyle that you guys are living right now, what would you give them as some advice? 
Well, just try something new, um, mm. or whatever it is, whether it's um, having having a go at a detox, like a one month detox. And you learn something from that, or maybe just growing one thing that you don't already grow at home. I think just having a go at something new, and when you do that, you educate yourself, and maybe you have another go at something else next year, and the progression happens slowly. I don't think uh, for us it happened quickly. It happened from just trying lots of things over a long period of time and slowly changing the way we think. So is there any part of what you guys have chosen to do that you would definitely not repeat if you started over and did it again? Um, yeah, I would not have started in the middle of winter. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the land took that was six, hard. <laughs> the land takes six months to go through. And when it did, it was the middle of winter. And mm. In hindsight, we shouldn't have tried to move to the land. And yeah, I think it's better to make a plan without moving to the land and look and maybe renting nearby or something like that um, and looking after yourselves, um, looking after your comfort before just trying to rush into something so big. So kind of what I'm hearing is kind of smaller steps and just kind of planning out your season. So literally when you make a shift, make sure you're making the shift in a season that's most kind to making the shift. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because you – you don't know how much tolerance you have for certain weather mm -hmm. until you're actually in it. <laughs> and we've been living in Singapore that has one season pretty much all year uh, for the last three years. So coming into winter was a bit of a shock to the system. So I guess we would have changed that. But everything else, I think it, it happened the way it happened. We, there's no way we could know to do it any other way, I don't think. Well, that's the nature of living, right? When you're truly living, life teaches you lessons that you didn't expect. Right. You can't plan out every single day the same because life brings you other things to do and to, to learn, right? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Every day. Every day there's something new. We have like a to-do list for the month. <laughs> and um, after halfway through the month, it's doubled in size because of all these new high priority things that have come up that we never knew about. Well, it's beautiful that if you ever lived in a rut where you're at, they're probably just ruts in the soil after a good rain. Nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're here. <laughs> Very awesome. Well, any other final thoughts, words of wisdom that you'd like to share with everybody before we let you go? No, just uh, follow your dreams. Uh, as soon as you start to follow your dreams, I find that things open up and it becomes possible much easier than you think. Well, that's wonderful. And again, how we they can best find you through KeelaYogaFarm.com after today. Yeah. And then yes. on Facebook, <laughs> Facebook at Keela Yoga Farm, also on Facebook. Is that the best places to find that's you? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And they can just make a request to find out when they can come and join you there in Portugal? Yeah, and we got courses here on permaculture, gardening, courses here on yoga. And we're always gardening, we're always doing yoga, but the, the structure is different every time. But most of the year it's just volunteer, come here for a month, get away from work, um, and get involved. So what's the average time that people come and join you down there? About a month. We have right. a minimum of two weeks. Minimum two weeks. That's great to know. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good enough time to actually feel like you've left something rather than you're just stepping a stepping stone back home again, right? Yeah. Exactly. I know for my own kids, it's like we got to be gone at least three days before we're actually gone. <laughs> <laughs> and then another three days to have them convinced that we're never going back. <laughs> <laughs> And then we have less complaints and people actually exist. They start living in that new space, that new place that they found. Yeah, they become more immersed definitely after two weeks. Good. It takes two weeks yeah. for people to really, really settle just in. let go. Yeah. So I like it. So you'd recommend a, a month, but your real minimum is, is two weeks. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Two weeks is good. Very good. Well, what awesome friends – you are likely make as all these people come in from wherever they're coming from. Oh yeah, we love it. Yeah, we've we've made such great friends on the way. 
um people that will will know forever for yeah. sure it's been fantastic we've been coming back as well yeah so it's, it's good well hopefully a lot of our listeners are going to come find you guys and uh make a friend with you as well just as you become a bit of my friend here on this podcast today yeah great, great. <laughs> thank you Look forward to meeting you more in the future. Well, thanks again for joining us. And uh, everybody, hopefully you guys had a great time listening to this experience that they've been on. They brought you into and inviting you to join them in. Thank you very much, Cool. Thanks, Justin. You're welcome. Have a great day.